<laughs> okay, Great good. Mind. <laughs> so as a chief complaint, uh, so we have a 52 year old male presenting with weakness greater than 10 years ago. And giving you a little bit more information, uh, the patient noticed the diffic difficulty with ambulating, especially climbing stairs and standing up from a seated position. In addition, he had also difficulty reaching for items from cabinets. He also complained of, of some difficulty with swallowing, of, of swallowing liquids especially, and he stated that he had decreased libido and significant difficulty achieving an erection and lacked any active sexual life. And I would stop right here before giving more information. Amazing. Jim, I just want to make sure that I have the time course correctly. Did you say 10, 10 years of symptoms? Yes, yes. The weakness is uh, greater than 10 years ago. And uh, he was diagnosed with a diagnosis that wasn't actual diagnosed, but I will reveal later. Okay, okay. Well, you know, I think um, uh, maybe the biggest challenge of this case is how we're going to cover 10 years of symptom progression in 25 minutes. But if we put that one aside, I think we can frame this case through the general lens that we oftentimes think about weakness. Um, I think there's um, uh, the first branch point that we oftentimes ask ourselves is, is this asthenia or is this true neurological weakness? Asthenia referring to the sensation of weakness, but ne um, not necessarily the absence of weakness on, or not necessarily the absence of strength on exam. So when we have a URI or Shema right now, while she's feeling unwell, may feel a little bit asthenic, right? Just not quite with the normal strength or normal pizzazz that one usually possesses. But again, on focal neurologic testing, we won't necessarily see weakness on exam. So that brand point of is this asthenia or is this weakness is the important one because asthenia we usually can look at a systemic illness whereas weakness we start to focus on the neurologic axis um, within the neurologic axis right we can think about the um, uh, central processes like the brain or the cord as well as the anterior horn which can so, sort of manifest usually looking more like a peripheral process and then we can also think about more of the characteristic peripheral nervous system like the neuro like the peripheral nerves the NMJ and the muscles. The pattern of this individual's weakness with primarily being pro proximal muscle weakness, right? Using the quads to get up out of the chair and the deltoids to reach for things or to comb, to comb one's hair starts to localize primarily into a myopathy. That's usually the distribution of weakness that we see in individuals who are suffering from a myopathy. But I think like um, uh, I'm tempering that um, uh, precision here just given the fact that uh, the symptoms started at an age range of 12 years old, which is not um, which is not a uh, uh, a population that I'm necessarily super comfortable taking care of. So I'm curious if how how these how those features of like the age and the tempo are are influencing your thoughts, Charmaine. Yeah, so the patient is 52, not 22, just FYI, Jack. Ah, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, like, yeah, I was like, oh, 22, I'm like, ooh, genetic, pediatrics. <laughs> so, this is a great thought exercise, just a little bit out of scope of my comfort. Um, yeah, no, I love your discussion so far, Jack. I think the question becomes like, hey, is this kind of a chronic condition that has now worsened with new symptoms uh, and it's evolving? Or, you know, is there a background of this like asthenia of some sort of a new uh, like deficits, which I think we can get a little bit more clarity as we get more history. I love your discussion. I was like thinking about more proximal as well. And I think like myopathies is a good discussion. Um, so I can focus on um, the other aspect of her presentation, which I think if I heard correctly, she also has difficulty uh, swallowing, especially liquids. So um, thinking about this dysphagia, I often think about like, uh, you know, uh, like Steph Lay had a great uh, CP solver blog post about dysphagia that I highly recommend. But basically thinking about oropharyngeal versus esophageal, um, kind of a dysphagia with oropharyngeal thinking more motility and structures, you know, strokes, dementia, usually people tend to have more oropharyngeal dysfunction. With uh, her presentation specifically with saying liquid getting stuck, it makes me more worried about esophageal, especially in a setting of like this background of like a uh, myopathy or a neurological deficit. So thinking about both esophageal, both structural and motility causes, with structural causes, you know, we tend to initially patients have more uh, troubles with solids over liquids and usually with motility, they have both troubles with both. And, you know, with 
I'm just start thinking about like maybe is there esophageal pathology that kind of ties into kind of her systemic presentations as well. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to uh, learn more, uh, Shema. Amazing discussion. So uh, I would now give you some more detailed information about this patient. So first of all, um, he was there for treatment uh, with um, intravenous immune globulins because um, it was presumed that he, he were, that he was having polymyositis and um, also giving a, a little bit more of the um, HPI. He denied any associated pain, no sensory symptoms. And um, coming to his family history, um, he was having an older, uh, older deceased brother with similar symptoms and uh, a maternal uncle and maternal cousins with similar symptoms. And um, now also, um, again, do you, uh, I would also give you the um, examination. So upon examination, um, on the neurological exam, there was lower facial weakness with evidence of myokinia in the chin muscles and tongue atrophy with testiculations. And the strength testing showed proximal weakness in the upper and lower extremities with trace to absent reflexes. And we also noted that he was having some gynecomastia. I hope I pronounce it correctly. And also um, some other information about the patient. So he was carrying the diagnosis of polymyositis back um, since 2000. And at the time of the investigations, he was having a CK of over 1,500. And in the MRI, we found some atrophy and increased signal in the T1 images but we didn't do any EMG, we didn't do any nerve conduction study, and we didn't perform any muscle biopsy. So because I thought he had polymyositis, he was treated with um, some high dose prednisone, which did not improve his clinical symptoms, but did, improve C but did improve his CK levels, according to his wife. So he was treated with various immunosuppressants, but we failed, like he was treated with MTX, Azathioprine, Cyclosporin, MMF. Yeah, and I would stop right here. Wow, what a case. Um, Shame, I thank you so much for uh, sharing. And I'll say share some initial thought and then have Jack uh, add to it. Um, so I think it is definitely, uh, I'm making a note that there it might be like a familial component to this uh, illness so with you know multiple family members having some form of weakness however again you know uh, it would be helpful to kind of drill down kind of you know weakness it's a really big bucket. So like there's symptomatology and how it's similar and different from the patient. Um, so now going through the exam, uh, you know, with kind of the fasciculations, absent reflexes, and also for, uh, facial weakness, you know, thinking about both like the upper motor neuron and lower motor neurons involvement. And, you know, kind of the, with the dysphagia, you know, uh, uh, dysfunction, you know, like ALS type uh, illness comes to my mind. And when Whenever I think about that, I also think, kind of think about like the mimickers. Usually they're slow and progressive, but, you know, cervical myel myelopathies is another good thing to consider when you're thinking these diseases and also your neuromuscular junction disorders. You know, myasthenic uh, gravis, Lambert-Eaton is another one to think about. And in terms of the myopathy world, although this, um, I agree uh, with you, Shema, that this doesn't quite seems like a polymyositis type pictures. Inclusion body myositis sometimes is a good mimicker um, to think about as well and a progressive like kind of muscular atrophy uh, of some sort. Um, so those are like, uh, you know, I'm kind of debating between this like uh, upper motor neuron and a lower motor neurons presentations together. Um, and, you know, there's like vitamin deficiencies to think about as well, you know, B12, all of that jazz. Um, anything to add, um, Jack? Uh, I'm curious to also hear like how you're incorporating the gynecomastia in this. Yeah, honestly, I think it's, um, uh, I'm really grappling here with sort of the 
the um, signal for an inherited disorder, particularly given what you had mentioned in terms of the family members, but also the fact that this seems like it's something that, um, uh, it seems like it's a disease process that is sort of um, not necessarily fitting um, neatly within the classic presentation that we might expect to see for certain inherited disorders. For example, something like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, right, usually has a much, much earlier age of onset than we would see here with this person who presented in their 50s, but with symptoms early on in their 40s. And so I completely agree with you sort of looking at the, the combination of the upper motor neuron disease um, and, uh, or I guess possibly motor motor neuron disease in general with there being both bulbar and, and peripheral muscle symptoms. I think the ALS comes into play 100%. Um, the way that I think I'm, I'm folding in the gynecomastia here is sort of saying, you know, is this true, true and related or is this true, true and unrelated? There is a long list of things that can cause gynecomastia for individuals in the primary care setting. Most commonly things that we may see are going to be medications that someone might take, for example, spironolactone and other MRAs, um, uh, but, but particularly spironolactone can cause the development of gynecomastia. And then we can also see certain other disorders of the endocrine axis. If we start to like draw an overlap here of disorders of the endocrine axis that can also present with muscle weakness, those usually are going to be myopathic in nature, which is as as you mentioned, Charmaine, we may not necessarily expect to see fasciculations like this, but just to run through that list of what are the endocrine related myopathies, the two big ones that we can see are hypothyroidism as well as Cushing. Um, and so can then, um, could both of those potentially cause gynecomastia? I don't know, honestly, about, about hypothyroidism. It seems plausible, right? If the, if the HPTA axis is on the hook in some capacity, you can sometimes see changes in these hormones because there's such an intricate link between the various hormone systems. Thyroid hormone and sex hormones can play a role in influencing one another. But I think certainly we can see gynecomastia associated with Cushing syndrome. But the crux of that here is that Cushing's disease that, that goes undetected for 10 years, we would expect to see many of the other characteristic features of glucocorticoid excess, right? Things like diabetes, changes in skin like striae, weight gain, the presence of the buffalo hump on the posterior spine, and those features seem conspicuously absent. We've talked before about how individuals with ectopic ACTH production can sometimes have an atypical Cushing's phenotype, but again, you would expect that something brewing for 10 years would make itself known, and so I think I'm grappling with, like, is this an endocrine process that's impacting the neuromuscular access, of which case those two would be plausible, or are we actually dealing with two separate paths that we need to explore? Let's work up the endocrine axis with the gynecomastia and the erectile dysfunction, and let's pursue the neuromuscular axis. That latter path of let's work them up in parallel seems like it'll probably be more diagnostically fruitful, and they may conjoin again down the road. But I think assuming that they're related like this up front um, may lead us to anchor a little bit a little bit earlier on. Yeah, that was a beautiful thought. Just a big shout out to Alec for uh, doing some Googling uh, and finding Kennedy disease. And I absolutely right, Alec, like Kennedy disease is such a great thought um, here. My understanding is that like, you know, age of onset tends to be like fourth or fifth decade with Kennedy's and it's a spinal bulbar muscular atrophy. It is genetic, I think. Um, so that is kind of fits nicely into this uh, disease as well. And it causes like proximal muscles. I think both the the tongue atrophy is quite unique. And um, I didn't know that it actually can cause gynecomastia as well, which just seems to be a, a unique feature of it. So uh, that is a really, really great thought, Alec. Um, and gynecomastia is a good learning for me here too. So that's definitely, I think, a good contender for this patient. Great discussion. So I will now give you some uh, additional information. In 2007, he had a muscle biopsy which showed end-stage muscle atrophy with severe myofiber atrophy and fatty replacement of the muscle. And in 2011, we did a follow-up MRI of the right thigh, which showed muscle atrophy and edema in the right thigh. And we also did some swallow evaluation in 2011 that showed trace aspiration with a large bolus of thin liquids with residual in the vallecula. I hope I pronounced correct. And then he received a treatment with uh, IVIX um, over three days, but he didn't show any improvement um, to the prior treatments of prednisone and multiple immune suppressive medications. And I have one last 
And do you also want the electrodiagnostic study or should I stop? Okay, I give it. So, in, in the, okay, in the electrodiagnostic study, so um, there was evidence of diffuse chronic lower motor neuron changes with active and chronic denervation potentials seen in cervical, lumbosacral, and cranial innervated myotomes. And I would later then reveal the diagnosis. All right. Well, it, it seems like we at least have some clarity here based off of the EMG findings that what we're dealing with is actually a neuropathic process as opposed to a, as opposed to a myopathic process exclusively, right? The combination of the elevated CK levels chronically and as well as the lower motor neuron disease, I think can help us a little bit here um, uh, in terms of thinking about the progress that we can make. I say that because a lot, I think things that we had mentioned, although again, I would I would have to look this up, is that something like Kennedy disease that Alec mentioned, I, I have in my brain that that's a primarily a myopathy, but whether it's a neuro, um, uh, uh, I guess a neuropathic myopathy or whether both are on the hook, I would have to, so thank you, Charmaine. So it sounds like it's a pure motor neuropathy. So I think that still potentially stays on, on the hook here, but I'm getting so far outside of my like zone of comfort or my, um, not even comfort, just like ability to plausibly reason here, um, uh, given that we're potentially dealing with the overlap of genetic inherited um, neuromuscular disorders. Um, and so I think like if I were to be totally authentic to the case, I would be like, which part of the neuroaxis can we localize this to? And how can we go from there? And I think I would probably honestly at this point focus more on my efforts on falsifying the diagnoses that I that I know of, which can be quite morbid here. So thinking about something like ALS, for example. Um, again, I think we have this sort of hormonal access that's on the hook here, which doesn't map on well to some of those sort of characteristic motor neuron diseases that we can end up seeing. Um, and so I, I think sort of would be asking the question of like, is does this seem like one of the um, uh, potentially morbid de degenerative neurologic diseases, for example, like ALS? And if we're sort of able to falsify that hypothesis to a meaningful extent, then I think it's sort of, um, uh, I will uh, uh, be honest here that I, I don't know that I can take this much further without the help of a specialist. Oh, uh, yeah, I am right there with you, my friend. Uh, but yeah, I think I, I would do the same as you're doing and thinking about like, okay, what are my pure motor syndromes, right? And especially thinking, okay, this is the pure more, uh, motor neuro syndrome. It sounds like we're mostly in the uh, PNS and then thinking about the nerves and neuromuscular junctions. And I agree, like probably muscles, myopathy is less likely here. And with the nerves, like, is it anterior horn? Is it a demyelinating? syndromes, uh, again, probably less likely. And then the gen genetics, I think, ooh, like a Kennedy disease, it was a wonderful uh, thought. And I think it quite fits nicely here, given like multiple familial generation. I, you know, Charcot-Marie tooth variant is another genetic pure motor thing that I think about that I think is less likely here. But again, uh, and then um, in terms of like neuromuscular junction, I feel like, you know, myasthenia is always a good thing to consider in these type of cases. But yeah, I think like kind of a genetic pure motor syndrome is how I would be thinking about this and then asking our neurologists for their inputs. Yeah. Wow. The other thing is like, we may be able to take it further. I was just looking to like go, go back and be like, is there, I, um, so many times I have overlooked the pattern of inheritance and just going back here and be like, is there anything that we can glean from this as well? That sounds like it's primarily men in the family, oops, who have this affliction um, and coming from the maternal side. Sorry, we have a timer on the lights here. And so um, uh, like, are there are there other X-linked diseases that, that this could be? Because I think the, at least the pattern of inheritance that we see here seems like it could follow in an X-linked inheritance pattern. That is a great thought. Um, yeah, uh, Shema, teach us. I'm so excited <laughs> to learn. <laughs> I have to say, you actually don't need a neurologist. You did an ama amazing job. So basically, um, so based on the history, the exome findings, and also the, the, uh, the electrodiagnostic results, um, and this X-linked inheritance pattern, we were also assuming Kennedy disease, and then we performed a genetic test for it. And it came back positive, showing that in one 
allele, there was an expansion in the number of the um, sac repeats, so 49 repeats, and it was consistent with the full mutation of the gene. And so it, it uh, confirmed the, the diagnosis of Kennedy disease. And as you know, um, um, as you know, um, Kennedy disease is also um, like a differential for ALS. So I love the differential with ALS, Charmaine. Um, the thing with uh, Kennedy disease, where is the mutation in the androgen receptor? So this is like my mnemonic to remember why it also makes this sexual dysfunction, the gynecomastia, and it's also one of those um, trinucleotide disorders. And also great job for Alec for uh, putting it so, so quickly into the chat. And thank you so much for this amazing uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Shaman. Again, like, um, uh, I keep on keep on coming coming back to this theme of like finding um, finding the edges of knowledge, and I think found the edges quite early in this case, which means that there's um, quite a bit be, uh, on the horizon to learn from here. But yeah, thank you so much for bringing this, and what a fascinating case to get to think through. I mean, you know, like um, these are things that we end up that we may have some ex exposure to to read about, but I think if it wasn't for this space and this group. Um, the ability to actually think through a case like this and see how it unfolds in reality is something that I may never see over the course of my career. So it's uh, uh, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to get to sort of think through it in real time like this. Uh, yeah, no, this is like, I, I just need to remember Kennedy's disease for the ALS mimickers. This is such a wonderful reminder. And another pearl for uh, uh, Kennedy disease. You, you know, sometimes I feel like I just need to be jump started and things slowly <laughs> start to trickle in my uh, brain. Um, is that like diabetes? Also, a lot of patients, you know, um, they also have like, um, uh, in addition to like gynecomastia, like diabetes uh, tends to be common in this patient population too. So another fun fact, but this is such a great reminder. I need to go refresh my mind about Kennedy's. Uh, thanks, Shane. This was wonderful. All right, Yasmin, we're ready for you. Wow, thank you for this amazing case. I didn't know about Kennedy disease until today. So um, thank you very much for all the amazing pearls this discussion. And so we approached this patient with the weakness. Is it asthenia or is it trinological weakness? And Dr. Jack told us that for asthenia, let's look for systemic illnesses. And if it's a trinological weakness, we have to determine if it's a central issue being brain or spinal cord, especially the anterior horn, or a peripheral system issue, especially neuromuscular junctions. Uh, we should test motor and strength in all limbs. And uh, Dr. Charmin told us if, uh, there is, if this weakness has worsened, how has it evolved? Is it accompanied by other signs and symptoms? Now we approach this phagia being oropharyngeal or esophageal. Uh, maybe structures, strictures, strokes, dementia, systemic illnesses such as scleroderma. And if it's only solid, think of mechanical obstruction. If it's both solid and liquid, go more to the neuromuscular disorder option. Now for combined motor neuro disease, things think ALS, which is actually a DDX for our actual diagnostic. Uh, we went into the causes of gyne gynecomastia, which could be an endocrinopathy such as hypothyroidism and Cushing, but Dr. Jack told us that in this bucket, there will be more signs and symptoms associated. Uh, also, the drugs such as spironolactone, and then uh, Dr. Alec in the chat told us about Kennedy disease, which is an spina bulbar muscular atrophy that mainly in males under 20s to 40s, although it can happen in elder uh, patients. There is limb weakness, weakness of facial and thumb muscles that lead to dysphagia, fasciculations and tremor, gynecomastia. And to diagnose this rare disease, you will need EMG plus the DNA test. Uh, it's, it's an ALS mimicker, but we also have to consider that in the differential, Guillain-Barre, Eistinac rabies, and multiple sclerosis. Now, to determine if it's neuropathic versus myopathic disorders, we should uh, take into consideration motor neuron symptoms and CK levels, although it's very tricky to find them out. And of course, if there is a genetic cause, we will need obviously genetic testing. And those are all the teaching points for today. Uh, back to you, Dr. Jack and Dr. Shermi. I got nothing else, um, but just, uh, yeah, uh, one, wonderful teaching points, yes. Yeah, thank you for helping us distract um, or uh, uh, distill the learning from this case and uh, uh, humbled, humbled once again by by the VMR space and by Shema. So thanks everyone for coming out today. Sharmin, any final closing words? 
No, thanks all. It turns out I was not caffeinated enough for a shame my case. <laughs> there was so no amount of caffeine on that one. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much. We appreciate you. Thank you for teaching me and learning with us. Bye. See y'all.